<coughs> Ebola from Africa, and it came out of Africa about 70,000 years ago, spread all the country, all the world. It was only about 10,000 years ago that Africa was lost. Up until then, 10 million years, the diet of the hate of the hunter gatherers. So the hate, whatever, was available in a very crude form. They were very crude. We assume that there is some evidence, of course, of the hate. But clearly, uh, it was not uh, processed and cooked like what we eat today. <coughs> So my, the point I'm trying to make is that our systems, as a system, evolved to the kind of food, you see, which is very crude, very rude and crude. But in the last, uh, maybe just 100 years or 50 years, we have subjected this, this system to, uh, to process and purify foods. And that is considered to be one of the main causes of the health problems that we have today. That our systems can handle that. This highly processed, highly purified food, that's the fundamental issue. There are other factors also involved. <coughs> this is data from the US, which is rather data in this Sri Lanka, but she also the problem of obesity. Obesity means, uh, you know, you define Overweight and obesity, I'm sure you're aware of that by the body mass index. You know, 25 is overweight, 30 is obese, and you can see the huge, huge uh, change. Just over about you know, 17 years, a massive change in the number of people who are overweight and obese. It is this is the number one problem in those developed countries today. This, this obesity, of course, leads to uh, all kinds of other problems, health problems, which are generally known as NCDs, non chemical diseases, starting from diabetes to yes, the diabetes increasing and very heavy now in some areas. So, uh, now this, this is related, obesity and these are related to diet primarily, but also to a sedentary lifestyle. Maybe computers are to blame. Because we, all of us, have spend a lot of time in front of computers, and so activity has decreased, and so on. So the lifestyle, it's a lifestyle. The lifestyle is quite different from what we evolved for 10 million years, the last so many years, we've been subjecting our system, ourselves to this big change in diet, <coughs> in lifestyles, and leading to these uh, problems. Also, very costly for governments. Now, people, of course, are aware of this. We all are so concerned, and you can see from the popularity of the of these walkways in Colombo, these bathroom on the water's edge, very popular. You know, hundreds and hundreds of walking in the morning. So, people are aware of this. They need to change their lifestyle. To become healthy, they know the link. Okay. And uh, also, of course, health costs are very expensive. It's not the reason that we want to fall ill today. So, people are really conscious and they have started walking. So, but exercise alone, of course, is not enough. So perhaps what's more important is your diet, what you eat. And there, I think the problem is that people are. If you can't fit. I think even so called people with some so called educated people are confused as to because they because the media tells you different things at different times. So sometimes it's very difficult to select what, what you should eat, what you need to eat. So this is where I think these functional foods can be of some assistance. They are not the answer, but they are, they are part of the answer to changing your Habits. So, what are functional foods? <coughs> it's Hippocrates who first, like many other things, Hippocrates 
Menoy is a Greek philosopher, considered the father of medicine, who first pointed out that uh, <coughs> disease is not caused by the gods, it's caused by things on earth, and so on. The first scientific input into, into uh, disease. He's also, he also said this, should I die food with thy medicine, with thy medicine for food. Now that does not mean that you can, if you are sick, very sick, can you bed with fever, you can eat your way out of it. See? I think that's, that's not what's meant here. What's meant here is to select the correct kind of foods. They'll help you to remain healthy, to prevent these things. I think that's, you've got to interpret this like that, in that sense. So I think this still holds true today, and this is really the basis of this fundamental function of foods. So there's still some dispute among scientists for the definition of functional foods. And uh, but we regulate, so we don't regulate this. I'm still not happy with some of the definitions. But I think this is as good as any. <coughs> functional foods are foods that provide additional physiological benefit beyond that of eating basic nutrition needs. You know, we, we know food usually has providing nutrients, energy proteins, minerals, vitamins, the nutrients we, we eat primarily to get those nutrients. But there are other benefits as well from food. If you select the correct foods, even from fast foods, you can get the nutrients. But they know they, you all know they are good for you. So functional foods are defined like this. There's some arguments about this, but still I think there's any. <coughs> the only country so far that has really regulated this, identifying functional foods, and we can put them on the label for labeling and so on, is Japan. And I mean, for some time, they call them foods for special health, the fossil foods. There were 17 over 100, I think, they identified. They are registered, regulated and they put on the label and so on, so you can go around and select them. And you know that they have some characteristics. Now just a, <coughs> now medicinal plants are different. Medicinal plants are, in Sri Lanka we have like 1,400 of them, I define medicinal plants. Now that is a little different from uh, functional foods. I just want you to appreciate the difference. Okay. Functional foods are foods that we eat every day which have benefits in addition to new nutrition. Medicinal plants are things we specifically take for particular ailments. <coughs> of course, there are, there are gray areas we do this too, very often. Okay? Some things we eat, this is good for you, and so you eat it. Okay? But it's not a normal part of the diet. Now, just for, for description's sake, I'd like to divide the functions, the functional foods, what are the functions okay, that we talked about, and what are the components that are responsible for those functions. Just for describing, I'd like to divide into the active <coughs> ones that are, uh, that affect our uh, gastrointestinal tract, and ones that are, that affect you after absorption. That's what description say, the different components. First, a very brief word on uh, <coughs> function and health. The gut uh, has basically three functions, three important functions that are important for health. It's called movements, that the proper passage of food through the, through the tract, it's crucial digestion, and to health and well being. And as you need <coughs> proper movement that's controlled by Stasis mainly, but also by hormones and all kinds of a complex system which control the movement. Second, examine digestion, you're aware of that. The body produces enzymes, which breaks down the large, uh, large molecules into small molecules which can be absorbed in carbohydrates, repeats, proteins, and nutric acids. By enzymes produced in the gastrointestinal tract. But there's a third component. It's a microbial action, which there is not much information on this, but normal people are beginning to realize it's a very important part of the digestive process. <coughs> There's some 500 species of microbes, 100 trillion trillion cells. The number of cells 
of microbial cells in our intestines is greater than the number of cells in our whole body. Okay. So they can't just be there doing nothing. They've been there for a long time. And uh, of course they live on the food material that escapes the enzymatic digestion. But they have lots of uh, functions that we know of now. <coughs> they uh, produce, they, they are able to digest things which cannot be digestible, the enzymes. Okay. Nearly the fiber, the soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, and so on. They also, the products of digestion can be absorbed by the body and can be used for energy, mainly energy. The fiber is broken down to mainly small cell fatty acids. And those are absorbed and used by our body for energy. They produce vitamins, which there is no evidence that they can be absorbed in the lower gut. But uh, <clears throat> we feel that those are important in the past. So, for instance, um, for instance, you know, before now we are all very hygienic. You we have soap and so on, but not for ten million years, you know. So eventually, people, I think, there are some fecal contamination of food and things. There's always some vitamins produced in the large gut, which in the gut might be the digestive and so on. Then apart from this, the microbes are also important in, uh, in what they call training our immune system. That's a term they use. The body is able to differentiate between the the good, the good microbes and the bad ones. So if they produce antibodies to all the bad, good ones also, then there are problems. You know? But the body recognizes, can tell the good from the bad. So. Okay. <clears throat> in fact, if you take all these micro species, there are a few of them which we consider as good microbes, beneficial. Whereas the other ones are not good, like E. coli, interrupt. So which cause problems. So there's always a balance between those two. It's a, it's a very complex ecosystem there. And of course, influenced by the food. That's a crucial thing. The type of what we eat, what we goes down without being digested here, will be taken up by the bacteria. And it's a constantly changing dynamic population of microbes. And they think our our set, and they also, there are hormones involved in anyway. They think our whole, <coughs> our, even our well-being, feel comfort, feeling of comfort, all that, finally depends on uh, which type of food you've been digested by the bugs. Are they producing too much gas? Do you feel uncomfortable? And so on. This goes on all the time. So what we eat <coughs> will, uh, the, the proportion of different microbes will depend on what we eat, what is not digested here. And that will affect our mood and all kinds of things. You see. So the point here is that we must, in selecting food, we must try to encourage the what you call the good bet. Ones that won't really harm, ones that produce these fatty acids that we have to ingest and, and so on. So these are three sort of uh, <coughs> functions that are important for that health. So what are the components in food that influence this? So dietary fiber. <clears throat> now when you say dietary fiber, what we mean are is indigestible carbohydrate. So that's the term. Human dietary fiber is indigestible carbohydrate. That is all the carbohydrates that we cannot digest by the normal enzymes in the body. They are normally beta-linked carbohydrates, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides. <coughs> and for link guns, we can break down because all our amylases are at the far amylases. So dietary fiber can be of two kinds, insoluble and soluble. So the insoluble ones are the normal cellulosic fibers, which we are familiar with. Okay. Soluble dietary fibers are again the beta-linked soluble. Those like pectins, inulin, and, and plants are very high in those components as well. <coughs> so, what are the 
how do these influence that health? The industrial carbohydrates, mainly cellulose, mainly cellulose, to the hemicellulose, the plant structure, structural components of plants, they help gut movement because they give the bulk, they bulk the bulk of digestion, absorb water and bulk it. Bulk is important for movement. The study I know has shown that uh, on the average diet in Africa, when you compare the average diet in Africa and in the US, highly processed foods, the rate of passage in the African diet was three times as fast as the one in every American diet. You see. The American diet is virtually a set of stasis, you know, it's hardly moving, and that creates other problems over, over fermentation, cancer, all kinds of things. You see. So in other words, you need this diet refinement that. That will be a very high component of the foods that we eat when we evolved, you know, the last 10 million years. That we eat very rough stuff. So, insoluble fiber is very important, I think you all know, know that. <coughs> it also helps in absorbing certain cholesterol and so on, and it's absorption, those. The soluble, the soluble dietary fiber, now those can be digested by enzymes, they're soluble. Pectins, inulins, and so on. Inulins are They are uh, energy stores in plants, you know, and this beta uh, saccharides. <coughs> now those are important because they are digestible bacteria. And they promote the growth of these good bacteria in the, in the intestine. And that is that is known in nutritional terms as prebiotics. Anything that we eat which promotes the good bacteria. We call it prebiotics. You must have heard of this. <coughs> People promote a lot of foods, say they are prebiotic. In fact, some of these are now put into even children's formulations. <coughs> it's a soluble fiber, mainly in units. And they've also been shown to, uh, to assist things like calcium absorption and, and uh, other minerals as well. So they have an important role. So the industrial fiber will, will help with that movement and the vegetable fiber, sorry, the soluble fiber will, uh, will promote both the good microbes and absorption of some minerals. Then probiotics, <coughs> the term that's used is prebiotics are anything that promotes the good bacteria. Probiotics are the good bacteria. If you, if you consume something which contains good bacteria, that's called probiotics, and that is commonly used now. Mainly uh, lactobacilli and a few other bacteria are used as probiotics. That is, you have this mix of good and bad bacteria types, so you're trying to promote the good one. So you can actually feel this. We do that for animals a lot. Poultry, we feed the probiotics now, almost as a routine. The idea is to promote <coughs> these good bacteria in the gut. So those bacteria, bacteria species, are called probiotics. <coughs> and there are enzymes <coughs> and the component in foods. Uh, which help digestion, enzymatic digestion. Uh, examples are, of course, uh, papain in papaya, that's the best example, and there's also bromelain in pineapple, so proteolytic enzymes, powerful enzymes. And also honey, honey, these are full of enzymes. Milk also has some enzymes, about 50 enzymes, and so on. And so foods can have enzymes, okay, which can actually help even the enzymatic digestion. This is starch. Now, this is a new area, and there, there is some information on this. But all starches are not the same. So from wheat to wheat flour, rice flour, maize, manioc, you know, starches are there. There are different shapes, sizes, different configurations. And some of, some of it is resistant to digestion. 
when it is at all digested. I think wheat flour, pure, pure wheat flour, the type that we eat now, bread and so on, is almost 100% digested. But many of the others are not. And these also affected by cooking, processing of different kinds, including cooking. <coughs> so this is an area which is still not uh, completely sort of understood. It's an area of that you can do some work on, the simple techniques to do this. But there are some work I know done at the Institute of Paper at the Science Faculty, Pushkar Institute, there are sessions on this. <coughs> I think that will divide the three levels actually, easily available, poorly available and not available. I think the three factions. And of course, you can see they are very crucial. So, crucial because not only non digestible enzymes, so put that in the with the bacteria. But of course, again, uh, it's only the same type of bacteria that digest the fiber. It's slightly different. But again, it's not bad. It's something you can accept. The advantage here is that if it's poorly digested, then the glycemic response will be small. So the rate at which the glucose increases in your blood, so it's good for diabetics. That uh, <coughs> once your resistance starts, will reduce the rate of absorption of glucose. And uh, now that's also a very gray area, you know, this diabetes stuff that they should eat, starch and so on. And lots of, uh, because some experiments if you see are not well carried out, the confusion. And different people say different things. I can get all kinds of advice. So, so these are areas again which need to be <coughs> examined that you can do some research on. So those are the components. The three, the three actions, the functions are the movement, enzymatic digestion, and microbes. And these components in in foods, of course, includes them in this way. Now we move on to, I told you, we divided these functions into gut active and physiologically active. Now these are the physiological functions, which are after absorption. Things that are supposed to be affected <coughs> by these functional foods and components in the functional foods. The primary thing apparently is this oxidative stress. Okay, and because of that, these other things are <coughs> affected by these functional components. Blood pressure, blood sugar, malignancy, that's cancers, immune modulation, that's a very important function. And now, a lot of interesting, some functional foods, components, uh, are equipped on weight control. Weight. <coughs> now, immediately I must say that the evidence for this for this effect of functional components and foods on these things is anecdotal, ancient knowledge, wisdom, or whatever, grandmother's tales, or whatever, you know, that things, you know, they, they have been told throughout from our small days, eat a lot of greens, they are good for you, and so on, because anecdotal. <coughs> then epidemiology association. Okay. It's a very strong association between lycopene and prostate cancer, and all kinds of associations, epidemiological. And thirdly, there are some laboratory experiments, both in vitro, in cell systems, as well as uh, with uh, lab animals. But it's very difficult, or I say almost impossible, to demonstrate, say, effect of some particular antioxidant in a particular plant on cardiovascular disease in you, in a human being, you see. <coughs> you can do it with drugs, drugs that you have to do that. They have what's called double double line trials, so clinical trials. But foods are so complex, there are so many things, so many interactions that's very difficult to scientifically show in that manner, like, like for a drug, that this particular thing has that particular effect. So what we have is all these things. And in total, which you can't discount. For centuries, people have found that certain things work for certain diseases or conditions for you. The Association, which can measure, 
experimentation and of course the work experiments. Just a word on the main <coughs> effects of um, these functional foods is uh, anti as antioxidants, you must have all heard of this. Just a word on oxidative damage. It's essential for aerobic organisms like us, of course, because it is the its only role actually to accept electrons or hydrogen to form vector in the respiratory chain. But the problem is oxygen produces is highly reactive oxygen species in the body. In that final step, it is released to it is released by the body to uh, combine hydrogen. That point can go to oxygen, very reactive molecule. So these highly reactive oxygen species like these superoxide anions and things can cause a lot of damage to the body. So they damage proteins, lipids, DNA, and of course they lead to <coughs> DNA, they can lead to mutagenesis and cancer. If it's uh, now even if atherosclerosis of course is caused by damage to the to endothelium of the blood vessels. Okay and plaque formation due to reaction by the body. So they are also, <coughs> now they are, they are shown actually in both the models that at endothelium level, that antioxidants anti -oxid can cause that damage. So of course, atherosclerosis will lead to uh, cardiovascular problems, coronary heart disease and strokes <coughs> and so on, as well as inflammatory reasons in the disorder. So, So this is where these antioxidants become important. Uh, the linkage between antioxidants and these diseases, NCDs, lies here. <coughs> because the damage caused to these protein lipids and the DNA, <coughs> they damage the cell membrane. Of course, the body has a number of mechanisms to counter it, so they won't be alive. Both antioxidant mechanisms to prevent oxidation and also repair number of enzymes, body systems that are in place, different systems in different tissues. A lot of vitamins are involved, vitamin C is involved in lungs, for instance, and um, <coughs> selenium and vitamin E in red cells, they have a high oxygen content, and so on. So there are systems throughout the body. <coughs> And also repair, repair mainly for DNA repair. So the repair systems also. But what they say is that they're not always fully effective. Not 100 percent Some leak through. That is where these diseases are then caused. Okay. So this is the actually the rationale for antioxidants in foods helping the body to overcome or prevent these problems. <clears throat> but the question remains. The body, body has a number of antioxidant and repair mechanisms uh, which, which uh, are not always fully effective. So the assumption that even cancer is caused with the DNA repair is not complete. And you get a viable but normal cell. <coughs> but do antioxidants in foods help to combat damage? Well, we assume it is. See, but we, it cannot be shown, it cannot be demonstrated that a particular antioxidant, a particular food, okay? They've tried this. People have fed people with tons of tomatoes, and because tomatoes are lycopene, okay? But it's very difficult to, okay, it's so complex, it's very difficult, like a drug, to show. But all the evidence is there in the case that it does happen. This must be helping the body to. To come back, <coughs> or 
activated damage. Okay. <clears throat> Antioxidants in foods. So they are they are they are four are considered to help what we make to overcome oxidative stresses. Okay. And the major groups <coughs> are catenoids. So the fat soluble components, the colored compounds found in plants. <coughs> and it might be a carotene, lutein, like green and, and so on. I'll go to them in detail later. You know, acids, caric acid. These are often, there are thousands of these water soluble components in, in plants, which, <coughs> which uh, I'm sure none of you knows all about them. Pyrenoids. <coughs> So first, you take carotenoids, <coughs> colored fat soluble components. They are potent. And, they are potent antioxidants. Yeah. <coughs> Alpha and beta carotene, orange colored. Uh, I'll put these two here because these two are also precursors of vitamin A. See? That's a different thing. Vitamin A is an important nutrient, but both are uh, beta carotene, particularly, is a very potent antioxidant. Perhaps the most important. Of all the antioxidants. <coughs> Lutein, then red yellow, zeaxanthin, red yellow again, and I could be in red. Um, two and a half hours. So, the other day is red in a fruit, in particular, we should be in the lycopene. But also, even say, man, if you take mango or something, it's not only beta carotene, but you also get lycopene, like all mixed up. See? <coughs> Green leaves, of course, have all these things. Okay. But uh, the color is masked by the intense blue chlorophyll. They said the darker the darker the green, the color or something, the more of these things that you get. <coughs> so catenoids, perhaps the most important of these. Uh, zeaxanthin, I'll, I'll go later on, I'll tell you something about them. They are also important in <coughs> vision and in uh, this one is connected to uh, it's called macular regeneration. That's Regulation of the most sensitive part of your retina. This is one more, <coughs> which is not plant, it is animal, marine algae, and crustaceans, the red color that you get in prawns, and so on. Then, of course, these are the water soluble. <coughs> Antioxidants found in plants and fruits. Now there are, I think, several several thousand compounds as said. Now these are the commonest ones, <coughs> or the ones that are most studied. Flavonols, okay. flavones, flavones, anthocyanins, and flavones. There are a few others as well. <coughs> these are of course just names, I guess, but I think uh, these are the commonest ones in most plants. You know, this this lot, the flavonols. Quercetin and lecithin and so on. These are water soluble and anti <coughs> water soluble antioxidants found in plants. And the catenoids are the fat soluble. Just uh, <coughs> this, there is a method, a technique to measure this in vitro, like taking it with stuff and measure the, <coughs> the antioxidant capacity. It's called oxygen radical absorbance capacity of the rack. And I think they're doing it here. In the lab. <coughs> Just the now, apart from antioxidants, <coughs> so I talked about the gut active ones, but the physiologically active ones only talked about the antioxidants. But there are other beneficial compounds, which are also functional compounds in, in foods. Okay. Which I'm sure you all are familiar with. Look at the fatty acids. <coughs> Which are, you know, all these things you must actually read in the, read in the newspapers about these things. You know. <coughs> the source is mainly fish, fish oils. Uh, it's it's very complex, but now it, there are no question about the fact that these are, we need this. We need these means, uh, you know, that it's been known for a long time that these long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are required, uh, essential fatty acids. Vitamins. But of those, 
sama omega-3, which means the first double bond is in carbon atom number 3, the fatty acid. Omega-6 is <coughs> on the sixth. The important thing apparently is to balance the two. So you must have both omega-3 and omega-6, but they follow different pathways in the body. So normally most of our oils that we eat, coconut oils that we eat, tend to have omega-6. So what you need to do is restore the balance by taking in omega-3. Omega-3 is mainly from fish and fish oils, <coughs> primarily, but also in other places, but they are very high. Particularly the, the fish, fish from cold water fish. <coughs> very cold water fish have these high levels of omega-6. This is one of the reasons why Eskimos who don't eat any vegetables. Okay, you don't get heart attacks on because they have a very high intake of uh, six but yes, it's so <coughs> so that's another functional component. Once we have acid <coughs> associated again with some cancers and so on and uh, with uh, Cancer and weight management. <coughs> it's produced in a large intestine uh, by bacteria, mainly, on acid. And the uh, source is mainly ruminant milk and ruminants are animals in grass, cattle, and so on. Meat and milk of this CDA. Glucosinolates in dogs, and brassicas. I think broccoli is the best of the lot, but all those broccoli. Uh, so again, shown to be anti-cancer properties. <coughs> Last year was for like nuts and vegetable oil. These have been shown to lower cholesterol and so on. So, these are the sorry, important ones. Lignans on sesame oil and then uh, <coughs> flax seeds. Flax is castor. Uh, <coughs> so sesame oil has this lignans, which are antioxidants. And I've just taken picked a few monoacetic fatty acids. <coughs> that is, the one fatty acid is, uh, uh, sorry. One double bond in your face, rich in avocado. Avocado is uh, fresh, it's very high in fat, and honey is move fast, as we call it. And olive oil, as you know, is a, <coughs> a good for you and so on. There is some things to be this. It also has some antioxidants and so on. <coughs> There are, there are some others as well. So, so the co components in plants that are beneficial to you, what we call functional foods, functional components. First of all, they affect the gut, <coughs> gut movements and so on, absorption. And secondly, it can affect after absorption. And the main component of those are the antioxidants. Okay. So I talked about some detail. But there are other things as well. And there's enough sunlight. evidence for these things. Evidence is not, not cause and effect, but it's associated with the biological anecdote as well as some laboratory work. There's that sufficient evidence for us to accept this. <coughs> then there are a number of other chemicals specific to individual plants, like uh, in uh, the anodas, you get anonesin, which is Cancer and then lots of specific things as well. <coughs> so with this, finally, I will just go through some foods so and you can just see what's in them. That's a technical discussion. <coughs> Edible grains. <coughs> but these are of course something that we eat a lot. 
there are actually uh, this professor Pushpak Mara from Crop Science. He has identified about 31 or something he's published there. Uh, I'm interested in a long list of things. <coughs> Nira Mulia, Himpara, Masarana, Yinsarana, Pulpara, Kunwanda, and so on. See? Uh, Kadu Tampala, Sudu Tampala, Kuru Tampala, and so on. 31. See? And, uh, <coughs> and he's also identified here, some of them are eaten tradition, eaten raw. Okay. Some of them are made into a melon. Okay. Some of them are. <coughs> As infusions, okay. infusions or something else, like or even uh, or the candle, that sort of thing. <coughs> so uh, now there are reasons why, you know, traditionally why they have adopted a different system. So, you know, investigate why. But one thing that's clear to me is that if the all mix coconut, the reason for that is that one of the main benefits of these edible greens is the <coughs> is the calcimans. Otherwise, you can't absorb that. So, okay, that's, that's a traditional way of doing it, but that, there's a reason. I think that's a reason. Anyway, what are the functional components we can, can find in them? It's all insoluble fiber, really. Because we find in the vascular bundles and so on, the cellulose, so there will be some of like that. <coughs> Soluble fiber content. Uh, we, there is some information, but it's not complete. It is something that they simply need to measure. Take some of these things and measure the soluble fiber content, in the, the urines and uh, the pectins and so on. We don't know what those. <coughs> High dose of calcium. I think this may be the main function of the brain with this. The greener, the darker the material. Polyphenols. Polyphenols are, uh, there was a lot of information on that. Uh, people analyzed for these uh, different polyphenols. I've seen papers and papers full of figures uh, from different countries. Uh, <coughs> nobody has really done a good uh, meta analysis of that, so you can take some conclusions. But we know that, for instance, uh, the amaranthaceae are very high in some of these. So, the Tampala and <coughs> the species are high in these, and maybe that would be why, you know, Pulpana is taken on sort of the similar parts of kinds. Maybe there's one of these, uh, <coughs> and perhaps in its high levels of oxidants, but these are not the area. Fruits. <coughs> Picked a few of it, and then we can discuss. One papaya and mango. <coughs> we'll have the color <coughs> comes mainly from carotenes and the lycopene. There'll be some fiber, insoluble fiber, as well as there'll be some soluble fiber. Again, we don't know how much there is. But there is soluble fiber, is some area we don't know. There are fairly simple techniques. But they are very important for the microbial uh, population. So <coughs> uh, just uh, another point about this uh, uh, papaya and mango as well as other, you know, the fruits also. Those are antioxidants are found in the, in the, in the peel. So I think the plant produces them for <coughs> to prevent insect attack and fungal attack. So as, a, as a defense method. I have seen preparations where in mango they have mango drink where they put the skin also extract. And those are high in antioxidants. These phenols and dietary fiber. Pineapple has a protective enzyme, probably it's a powerful protective enzyme. This is one of the foods that we have. It's important source of polyphenols, very high levels of antioxidants. This. <coughs> and all, the, all three types the Aplano, the Rayano, and the Chetumai, they all have acetogenins. 
and cancer and so on. Estrogenins, <coughs> cancer cells in vitro, control cancer treatment is <coughs> in vitro, in, in the laboratory they are shown in the students to the cancer cells, cell systems in the laboratory. Cancer patients, even cancer patients, they have some Grapes, <coughs> the polyphenols, high, but green the skin. That's, that's the reason why they say red wine is good for you and uh, white wine, mainly because the red wine uses the skin. They say, glass of wine is good for you. And the seeds also, in fact, this uh, grape seed extract is used as uh, experiments for properties, many experiments in animals. Grape fruit, polyphenol, you can call it very good. What an antioxidant. Garlic, yeah, it's very rich in pectins, which is a Prebiotic, which is a soluble, soluble fiber, very high. Pectins, you know, pectins. What's uh, what pectins are? What causes a fruit to gel? You know, make the jelly. So pectins. <coughs> Those are beta linked. So they are they are like prebiotics and polyphenols as well. So guava is a cheap but Good fruit uh, for and low in sugar also. Good fruit for <coughs> for its uh, function. Doctor B is considered the champion of the mall now. Is pomegranate. It's equally expensive. Five <laughs> rupees of fruit. <laughs> but the real ones you get from you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan. You know, cut them like like they throw bleed. You know, very high end. People now <coughs> take the juice in the morning. So popular. Maybe that's the reason why it becomes so expensive. So there are others as well. All fruits, of course, have beneficial effects, either fiber or soluble fiber or antioxidants. These are some special ones. <coughs> Vegetables, uh, <coughs> all green vegetables, of course, will have fiber and carotene. Uh, there's green color, they have these carotenoids. Fiber. <coughs> but there are some which have special things of this, which are called caravillates, of course. There's lots of number of uh, chemicals in caravilla. High active chemicals causes, shown to cause apoptosis of cancer cells in this. Now, could diabetic effects so they call charantin. It's all shown, you know, the effects. <coughs> it was an antimicrobial antimicrobial effects as well. So, Carvilla is a, not something we can eat. Not very really tasty, but uh, it's really shown to be uh, effective now. <coughs> but the way we eat it, you know, we fry it, you know, it's, it's anything left in that of you fry and you slice and so on. But if you want, I think the full benefit, uh, they say, just drink the juice. No. <laughs> Never tried it myself. <coughs> Coca, uh, common uh, weed growing all over my garden, I know, my place. It's both the fruit and the uh, leaves. The leaves are used as a green. High levels of green the functions. It has a <coughs> chemical response for mass cell stabilization. Antihistaminic, antioxidant, immune system modulation. And so on. Tomato, <coughs> mainly the, the lycopene in the, the, the red color. It's lycopene, carotenoid, specifically linked to a number of cancers, but prostate cancer. Vasicas, <coughs> which are number of different uh, contain battery fiber, which you will see phytochemicals are immune system modulators again. Anti 
cancer and the viral properties. Help repair damaged DNA. So in laboratory system studies, therefore, that's important because damaged DNA can be repaired by this. So these all help the body to, to repair the DNA. So <coughs> damaged by the there's a bit again, aggressive prostate cancers. And the best of these is broccoli. There's also high in carotene, it's a really green one. <clears throat> again, the most expensive one. Now I see it's gone off the shelves in the supermarkets. It's so expensive. Yeah, but this is the best of the lot. <clears throat> then something much closer to it, Murunga. All parts are edible. The leaves are the best for nutrition as well as for this uh, <coughs> antioxidants and carotenoids and so on. Not so much what we eat, the uh, seeds and the fresh egg, but the nutritious soil that we have much in it. But uh, these are leaves and so I think. And also the roots, the roots also have this antioxidants. But all parts are the other. <coughs> so I mean, <coughs> the number of um, it has some positives and negatives. Uh, there are some, I think, uh, stack holes and graphic, graphic, you know, there are some carbohydrates which are beta linked, so which are like as prebiotics. Uh, alpha linolenic acid, which is uh, omega 3 fatty acid. And also, there are um, some isoflavones, uh, steroidal like compounds. So, uh, it has also anti nutritional factors and negative. And also they, they have found that when it's ferment, you know, particularly in the East, Japan and China and so on, they make a lot of fermented products, the soya, the soya sauce, and lots of tofus and so on. But those number of compounds are produced during fermentation by the, by the microorganisms. They, I listened to a paper once uh, from uh, Okinawa where they make a particular kind of tofu, where they found AC inhibitors, you know, the drugs that we, we take to control blood pressure of form during the, during the fermentation of dough at lower levels. But that is a sort of typical functional food aspect. You know, if we go to a doctor in high blood they give you AC inhibitors wondering big dose, you know, like hitting over the head with a pole to knock your thing down. But if you eat these things, then that helps the body to control the blood pressure. It's a different philosophy. So that is the essence of a functional food. That helps helps the body's physiology. Whereas the drug is outside, and it comes and hits you, right? and also creates a lot of side effects. So you sort of think that uh, to me that spells the essence of what we call functional food. Uh, to be a food that will help your body to keep healthy, keep the blood pressure under control, and all those other things. So that's so these fermented foods again very ancient. We don't have it here, but very ancient. Same in China. And so the East, important in <coughs> health. There are also other things, um, <coughs> uh, even uh, oats, for instance, oats. Oats have uh, some, uh, they have a fair number of insoluble fiber. So the oats. And uh, anyway, we we'll discuss those later. Carrots, of course, <coughs> I also carotene. Sweet potato is supposed to have resistant starch. So uh, <coughs> compared to uh, wheat, wheat is I think wheat pure purified wheat flour. You know, most of our products are made of white bread, all these pastries that are all the place, all made from pure, and those are hundred percent uh, vegetable. <laughs> but certainly these um, yams seem to contain a fair amount of resistant starch. Finally, condiments and beverages, <coughs> uh, the, they are high in antioxidants and so on. But of course, you remember, we use only very small amounts. You know? cinnamon, you see, we use small amounts, and they don't contribute much to the overall <coughs> food intake of antioxidants. Cinnamon, <coughs> the number of beneficial components in cinnamon. Sri Lankan cinnamon is the best of all. <coughs> Cinnamaldehyde, anti-cancer properties, 
methyl hydroxide charcoal polymer, water soluble flavonoid, and so on. Include incident sensitivity reduces the number of in experiments. But whether when you put a piece of cinnamon into your food, any whether <coughs> how much you get, I don't know. This is not the effect. Forbes, greater antioxidants, flavonoids, coriander leaves are antioxidants. <coughs> Turmeric. Turmeric is one of the most important uh, things used extensively in India for its antiseptic everywhere, so in their food. And, uh, <coughs> it's used as a condiment, as an antiseptic, and a natural food colorant. Contains 5% cu 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 coumarin, a polyphenol, known to act against colorectal cancer. Lowers blood glucose, increase improve insulin sensitivity, reduce, and so on. It's considered a very important. Uh, <coughs> that's it. And Indians have to use a lot of it. Cut a picture of them, put a few leaves, but also the leaves are very high in antioxidants. Garlic has a range of compounds, uh, nothing very specific, but it's supposed to have influence of things. Coffee, it's also in high in lipophilic antioxidants. <coughs> Tea contains the high levels of this antioxidant cation. <coughs> they say freshly picked tea leaf can, can have 30 percent cation, very high levels of this cation. <coughs> but when you make black tea, this gets oxidized in the process, the fermentation process, and you lose some. So that that's why it's a green tea in the black tea. Left. But correct levels, I'm told that there is no difference. <laughs> so, right? This is what uh, the paper said in the correct levels. So, even though during the fermentation, the cation is destroyed or changed, finding the antioxidant levels in both are similar. So. <coughs> Finally, <coughs> foods of animal origin also can be considered uh, to be. Functional foods, eggs. Maybe this uh, cat noise zeaxanthin on the yolk gives the yolk its color. <coughs> and of course, many, if you buy eggs you know, from a good farm now, they actually add the uh, silicon board or green leaves, so it gives a nice uh, yellow, um, orange colored yolk. It contains zeaxanthin, very important for this uh, <coughs> macular, the way it's macular genius of the Now they have these designer eggs. Uh, they are ones just coming to the market. You see that. But by feeding the hen with different things, you can actually increase the amounts sometimes in the egg. It's called designer eggs. <coughs> they, uh, they, it's been used mainly, uh, I think the ITI has developed uh, this. Uh, it's now been marketed. This Increases, increased uh, omega 3 fatty acid eggs <coughs> by feeding. Uh, in with, in the, you can you can actually have design eggs you can change this composition. And, uh, so these these things, design eggs are really functional foods. Because they contain functional components. And you can eat as a CLA, you can say. Fermented milk products, uh, <coughs> it contains lactose, which uh, you can recognize in the micro, but not in the intestine, and it's in the case. And most important, it's a probiotics. So that is, you, the bugs, the bacteria in, in fermented milk products, whatever they are, it's you, or whatever, will have the bacteria, those are all these beneficial. Conditions of the intestine. <coughs> what you're missing here, of course, is fish, because they are the main source of uh, omega 3. <coughs> okay, so find my final slide, come back to Hippocrates. <coughs> so that I look in the medicine, in the medicine of the food. So the idea is to 
role of highly processed and fast foods as well as other lifestyle changes as a cause of obesity is now completely acknowledged. We know that, we accept that, we will try to, try to change <coughs> the lifestyle. When you choose foods that you love them, the children do, and help. <coughs> the bigger challenge is the children. So the commercial pressures on them to eat these fast foods. So all that is difficult to change. So fast foods are an important part of this food choice. <coughs> Scientists to properly identify such beneficial effects and effectively convey the information to the last one. I see as the role of IFS here is <coughs> to uh, identify scientific. There are so many stories told. Every day somebody comes and tells you this is good for you, it's bad for you. Newspapers tell you it is good or bad. And as scientists, we have to try and find out okay. <coughs> when that is to try. We have some new idea now, we know that certain things have an effect. And the second part is even more important, effectively convey the information to the general public who are desperately seeking for information as to what they should be confused by this. So I know the IFS uh, has you know, a mandate to put out publications. Mm -hmm. okay. so because that's what, if you're working in this area of food, food science, mm -hmm. that you must Maybe TV discussions, or video discussions, or so must convey the information to people about this. So I finish with that. Anybody who's interest, interested in this, uh, I would advise you to read a review by Dr. Claire Hassler. Probably, I have a copy of that, I can give it to It's an excellent review of the area of functional foods. Because there's so much of talk of people saying all kinds of things. Where it lies, but the review lights will tell you what where the science lies at the moment. The science, the show. So I will stop there. I hope that uh, this will be useful to you and that you have got some idea of what functional foods are and how can they, how they can benefit us and the people at large and the value, the value of research. And Thank you.